Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading organization for journalists. My name is Michael Friedman, and I am the 113th president of the National Press Club. I am journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus and executive producer of the public broadcasting series, The Calb Report. We have an excellent program ahead, and we invite you to listen, watch, or follow along on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLive. For our C-SPAN and public radio viewers and listeners, please be aware that in the audience today are members of the general public, so any applause or reaction you may hear is not necessarily from the working press. Let's begin by introducing our head table. We ask that you please hold your applause until all of the head table guests have been announced. Beginning to my far left, John O'Shea, Colonel, U.S. Army, retired, and member of American Legion Post 20, which is based here at the National Press Club. Kevin Wensing, Captain, U.S. Navy, retired, and member of the National Press Club headliners team. Lolita Baldor, National Security Reporter for the Associated Press. Colonel Stephanie Ahern, Strategic Initiatives Advisor for the Secretary of the Army. John Donnelly, Senior Writer at CQ Roll Call and President of the Military Reporters and Editors Association. To my immediate right, Donna Leinwand Leger, President of DC Media Strategies, former National Press Club President and Co-Chair of the NPC Headliners team. We will meet our speaker, the Honorable Ryan McCarthy, Secretary of the United States Army, in just a moment. Then we have Jen Judson, land warfare reporter at Defense News and chair of the National Press Club Board of Governors. Anthony Capaccio, Pentagon reporter at Bloomberg News. Lieutenant Colonel Dries Harris, communications advisor for the Secretary of the United States Army. Yasmin Tajdeh, senior editor at National Defense Magazine. And Luke Knittig, Senior Director of Communications and Partnerships at the McCain Institute. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the members of our headliners team responsible for organizing today's luncheon, co-leaders Lori Russo of Stanton Communications, and once again, Donna Leinwan Leger of DC Media Strategies, as well as National Press Club staff liaison Lindsay Underwood, chef Susan Delbert, and Executive Director Bill McCarran. Our thanks to our head table and the team that put today's lunch together. <laughs> the U.S. Army faces myriad challenges here and abroad. In addition to ongoing operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, maintaining security and stability around the world, and keeping pace with adversaries including Russia and China, the Army is confronting domestic issues, including a high rate of suicides, a merger of military health facilities under the Defense Health Agency, and quality of life for our military families. President Trump's fiscal 2021 budget request submitted to Congress on February 10th left defense spending essentially flat compared with the previous year. Charged with meeting these challenges is Secretary of the United States Army, Ryan McCarthy, who comes to the job with a distinguished military service background, Pentagon duty, and private sector experience. Secretary McCarthy assumed his current post in September of 2019. The U.S. Army combat veteran had spent the previous two years as the 33rd Undersecretary of the Army. He has served at the Pentagon through both Republican and Democratic administrations as a special assistant to then Defense Secretary Robert Gates. Before his return to the Pentagon in 2017, Secretary McCarthy worked for Lockheed Martin on global security and the defense contractor's F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Program. In recent weeks, 
Sen Secretary McCarthy has spoken about the need to bolster the U.S. military presence in the Indo-Pacific region in keeping with the national defense strategy as a counter to the Chinese presence through its Belt and Road Initiative and the importance of continuing to test the military's multi-domain operations, a system for countering and defeating an adversary with similar capabilities in all domains, air, sea, land, space, and cyberspace, now in its third year. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the National Press Club, U.S. Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy. Good afternoon, uh, National Press Club. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me to join you for lunch. It's really great to get out of the Pentagon. It's healthy for the mind and the spirit. <laughs> I can appreciate the intense pressure, the tight timelines, and the currency of information that journalists live by. No doubt, the DC beat is the crucible of your profession. This is a busy city. In fact, this is a busy country. Progress and innovation are in America's DNA. Americans are extremely busy people. Therefore, each day, time becomes a math problem. Your work ensures that the Army's story becomes part of that daily equation. Your work serves as one of the touch points between the military and the public, highlighting the opportunities the Army holds for America's youth. Coverage continues to convey the important work of our deployed forces, engaging violent extremists on a daily basis in places like Iraq and Afghanistan in particular, now totaling two decades of continued combat operations in each. Written works preserve our Army and our nation's legacy, cataloging conflict and the subsequent ensuing peace. Your work helps us preserve the accounts of our heroes and mourn our fallen, by face and by name, and ultimately holds us accountable. It is because of a free press the nation knows that our men and women are the last line of defense for the freedoms they enjoy. Finally, I can commiserate with only being as good as your last story. With that in mind, let's get started. Some people resist change because they focus on what they're going to lose instead of what they're going to gain. So today, I'd like to highlight where the Army is in the midst of the transformational change structurally and what we're going to gain through our modernization investments. When the National Defense Strategy was published in 2018, it put the Defense Department on a new path, pulling us out of a singular focus on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations in the Middle East and expanding our priorities toward near-peer competitors such as Russia and China and rogue regimes such as North Korea and Iran. What we quickly realized was that major changes were needed and that if we did not rapidly modernize, we would lose overmatch and deterrence within the next 10 years. Ultimately, we could risk losing the next war. So, we changed. We changed our priorities to three clear distinct and distinct categories, readiness, modernization, and reform. We changed our readiness focus to include deploying any Army unit rapidly, when and where needed across the globe which we are calling strategic readiness, and changed the metrics to achieve it. We changed the way in which we aligned and managed our budget, putting every dollar against our priorities. And we've made clear that people are the foundation of these three priorities in all that we do. The Army has, and always will be, a people organization. The FY21 budget of $178 billion will ensure that the Army will remain the most lethal ground-fighting force in the world, now and in the future. We treat taxpayer dollars like we treat our ammunition. Every bullet counts, and it's aimed at a target. Today, I'd like to provide an update on two main topics, which are the Army's approach to strategic competition and our investment portfolio and returns. First, on competition. 
The Army plays a key role in building relationships with allies and partners worldwide, which has direct impacts on near-peer competitors. We are operating in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in the Indo-Pacific region. We are a persistent presence with formations in these strategic regions, totaling over 180,000 soldiers committed and over 140 countries, with our allies and partners in order to achieve our national objectives. We are 60% of combatant commanders' requirements worldwide. Yet our budget has remained flat for the past three years. Army operations are providing a huge dividend from our portion of the DOD budget, making the Army the most dynamic force and sound investment in the arsenal. There is no other service that is more relevant than the U.S. Army. In the Indo-Pacific and anywhere else, we are partnered where and with whom it matters most, on land where people live. There is no one else that has the staying power and the consistency for deterrence than the U.S. Army. No one on earth. The sun never sets on the U.S. Army. Having the Army routinely in the region, partnered with militaries, influences conditions on the ground, and ultimately, deserves as a deter deterrent by creating dilemmas for potential adversaries. Our presence and influence in the region strengthens America's position to conduct global commerce, builds confidence with investors, and enables America to compete economically. The Army's persistent presence, standing shoulder to shoulder with our allies and partners, changes the calculus in our adversaries' decision-making process. Our security cooperation pairs with other armies that are often the most prestigious institutions and are foundational to that country's identity, pivotal to professional civil relations, and have leaders with significant influence. For example, in the Indo-Pacific region, over 70% of CHADs are Army officers. This is why the U.S. Army engages with armies every day. And as a people business, we build relationships from the ground up. Efforts span from training partner forces to military student exchanges, foreign military sales, and security cooperation, and dedicated seats at the United States' prestigious senior war colleges. When the Army sells equipment, countries don't just get a box of good, some bolts, and a bill. Countries get a program, a strong relationship, and a steadfast partner they can rely on. Countries receive training from experts, reliable and modern weapons, assistance development, developing their doctrine, and a proven supply chain of support. For example, the Army has close partnerships with Poland and Lithuania, where we habitually train together every year for multiple weeks in the defense of their sovereign nations. Another example. Thailand purchased 60 strikers, and the Army is helping the Thai Army stand up their first striker units. The first wave of strikers were featured in the King's Coronation Parade and were so well liked that another hundred have been ordered. Our Army is helping the Philippines train 72 infantry battalions as they upgrade their equipment and evolve their doctrine. The U.S. Army is a force of choice and committed to remaining so. We build our partners up rather than manipulate them. To be able to compete in today's environment, we have to be present and show our commitment. This is why we're emphasizing strategic readiness and adjusting our force posture so that we can deploy trained and ready forces in the right place at the right time. The Army's ability to rapidly mobilize, deploy, and sustain combat forces, or strategic readiness, gives us the advantage over threats and potential adversaries. Strategic readiness will validate our new concepts, exercise our new formations, and provide an understanding of the logistical framework needed to sustain our forces. We will remain operationally dynamic, fast, and lethal. Take, for example, this on New Year's Eve, we deployed soldiers from the 82nd Airborne Division, cold start, no notice, to conduct an emergency deployment. The soldiers were literally at New Year's Eve gatherings with their families and within hours were on an airplane. Within days, 3,500 soldiers were on the ground nine time zones away, 
weapons ready to go in the Middle East. The speed in which we can project power is unprecedented. And we are using exercises such as emergency deployment readiness exercises, or EDRI for short, getting more repetitions and therefore increasing our speed. We deployed 1,300 soldiers from the 1st Armored Division on a known known as EDRI, and with days were alongside their Polish counterparts. In terms of leveraging exercises to hone our skills, in FY20, the Army is allocating funding for the Defender exercises in Europe, where we will push a division-sized unit of 20,000 troops and draw on 13,000 pieces of equipment to be ready and support contingency operations and to respond in any crises. Additionally, exercises in the Indo-Pacific will further test and demonstrate our power projection through the Pacific Pathways with our allies and partners. The FY21 exercise is expanding in the Indo-Pacific with over $300 million from our operations and maintenance accounts devoted towards these strategic exercises. We'll have troop op troops operating in countries like Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, and Palau, just to name a few. Our Regionally Aligned Security Force Assistance Brigades, or SFABs, with their advise and assist capability, continue to prove their worth as an economy of force. Little else sends messages like a boots on the ground, standing side by side with partner forces. The Army's goal for FY21 is to have six regionally aligned, fully manned, trained, and equipped SFABs. Another element of competition and deterrence is having a highly lethal combat credible force. This is why we established six modernization investment priorities and restructured the Army Enterprise with the establishment of Army Futures Command, which brought all of the stakeholders of the modernization continuum together and reduced the span time in decision making. This change has taken years off the acquisitions process and gave us a laser focus on modernizing for the future. The complexity of the battlefield of the future requires that we transform our 45-year-old fleet into new equipment portfolios into the formations today so that we can stay relevant, retain overmatch, and allow us to win decisively in the next war. Large-scale modernization takes time and patience. We have continued to prioritize the Army budget towards our six modernization priorities and 31 signature systems. These ranging from new squad level weapons, aircraft, and hypersonic missiles. Prototypes that began in FY18 and 19 are maturing with real capability landing in FY21 and 22. In this fiscal year, there will be an increase of test shots, capability demonstrations, and validation of the prototypes. This will all be tied together with cloud technology and the cloud will be the foundation of the entire modernization enterprise. Because of the cloud's importance, we are investing $800 million over the next five fiscal years into cloud architecture and will migrate other forms of data. We are increasing our investments across the modernization portfolios, increasing by $2.2 billion in FY21 to, FY20, FY20 to 21 which is a 26% increase year over year. With stable budgets and prioritized requirements, we have signaled to industry that we are committed to our modernization efforts. The demand for Army forces, paired against a flat budget, has forced tough fiscal decisions. So, in order to finance our modernization ambitions, we implemented reform. To build and maintain readiness, continue transformational modernization, and support real world operations, the Army conducted in depth program reviews, now known as night courts, for the last two years alone. In PB21, we have identified an, an additional 80 programs for elimination or reduction and generated $7.4 billion in savings for investment in Army and OSD priorities. I would highlight, I'd like to highlight some of our investments out of the 31 systems. Long-range precision fires is our number one modernization priority. And in FY21, we are investing over $800 million in hypersonics alone to support accelerated development, flight testing, and initial unit fielding and training in order to deliver our first hypersonics-capable operational unit ready to deploy by FY23. 
with regards to future vertical lift, our future long-range assault aircraft, the Black Hawk replacement. Demonstrations have multiple competitors with numerous flight hours logged already, 160 hours and over 70 hours respectively. Industry is meeting us at the table, and in this case, the companies are investing four to one. FARA, short for Future Attack Reconnaissance Aircraft, is the successor of the Kiowa. My teammate, the Chief of Staff of the Army, the most senior aviator in the Army, General James McConville, likes to say that we're gonna fly it before we buy it. We will down-select the two competitors on both FARA and FARA next month. Again, pretty exciting time as our disciplined approach towards modernization investments are moving towards real capability. We can see it, we can touch it, and we can test it. For soldiers' individual kit, we are developing the Integrated Visual Augmentation System, or IVAS, with the Microsoft Corporation, which is our heads-up display system that will serve as the nerve center for the Integrated Squad Combat System. Simply put, linking multiple shooters with multiple sensors and multiple C2 nodes. This allows the soldier to understand the threat picture in real time during day or nighttime operations. Reduces computation time from minutes down to seconds. <laughs> Speed and quality decision making increases our soldier's survivability and lethality. The Army's transformational modernization efforts continue to build on consistent priorities and a ruthlessly aligned budget. We are committed to our six modernization priorities and 31 signature systems, which will be the next generation of weaponry for the U.S. Army to win decisively in the future fight. When pairing with industry, setbacks and prototype shortcomings and failure are an inevitable part of innovation. However, when failure occurs, we are committed to making critical decisions early in the process and use the knowledge gained towards capability success. This is the case with our optionally manned fighting vehicle, or OMFV, which is the Bradley replacement vehicle. This is a capability the Army requires. We are taking our lessons learned in terms of requirements, cost sharing, and industry informed timelines, and therefore have adjusted the OMFV acquisition strategy. The Army is incredibly busy res responding to a wide array of contingencies. We respond to natural disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes and humanitarian crises. This is in addition to our current operations with 27,500 soldiers deployed to the Middle East. 10,000 of our men and women are in Afghanistan alone. Due to an increase for demand of forces, the Army will stay on trajectory of modest growth to 492,000 by FY26 for the active duty component. In closing, the Army remains steadfast in its priorities and have aligned our investments and budgets against the same. People are the foundation across all of our efforts. I'd like to wrap up the formal remarks here and take questions from the audience, because I know better than to filibuster journalists, because you buy ink by the barrel. <laughs> So um, again, thank you for having me, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Secretary McCarthy. We have a number of questions, as you indicated, and why don't we get to them? Uh, and let's begin with some breaking news. A senior U.S. official announced today that the United States and the Taliban have reached a truce agreement. What do you expect will happen in the coming days? What can you tell us about the terms of the truce and its impact on the Army? And what can you tell us about plans for foreign troop withdrawal, including U.S. troops from that region? Uh, this is a first step in, a, in the process to reach a political solution. So. It's going to take several weeks for this to unfold, but it's, uh, it's very encouraging that we're heading down the path to a political solution. The president of the Philippines said he has decided to end U.S. military access to his country. How will that affect your operation? So uh, I was actually 
in the Philippines about two weeks ago. Uh, you know, a long history uh, with a, that we've worked very hard together, very strong mill-to-mill -mill relations. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing where we, in discussions, we have about 175 days to work through this diplomatically. And I think we can drive towards a, an end state that will work out for, for all of us politically. Some budget issues. The procurement accounts appear to have taken hits across the current fleet in several areas from vehicles to aircraft. The Black Hawk saw a cut, as did several vehicle programs from Abrams to Bradley to Paladin and Ampi. Some are due to manufacturing issues. Other cuts are not explained. Is this a sign of the beginning of the Army's efforts to move funding away from current and legacy fleets toward future <coughs> systems? Can we anticipate a heavier pendulum swing in the FY22 budget? So uh, we're th into our third year in transforming, in particular, the modernization accounts, where uh, if you go back to just the FY18-19, we moved the S&T dollars uh, about 80% of the S&T dollars aligning against the six investment priorities, the 31 signature systems. The first major night court effort was in FY20. We, this is our second year of that. So we're starting to shift the dollars towards the new capabilities that we're investing in against the force. Uh, so with respect uh, to the Blackhawk, I, I think we, we're doing the multi-year there. Uh, the, the Abrams were over a billion dollars to buy in a full-up brigade set or that's our third year in a row. I mean, there's, we put over $6 billion in investment in the, um, the Abrams over the last four years. So uh, we're still maintaining upgrades with the current fleet, but over time you're starting to see us make the progression towards the new capabilities. And as you get further into this fit up, you'll see about 55 to 60% of the modernization accounts be invested against these new capabilities we're bringing into our formations. With all of the technological advances and the modernization of systems and weapons, what skill sets do you now want Army recruits to have, both enlisted and officers? This is a place where General McConville's leadership has really been remarkable so from his time as the G1, the Vice Chief, and, and now as the, the 40th Chief of Staff, with uh, the, is the energy behind talent management. And this is everything from how we're selecting officers to how we're recruiting them. Uh, he's put, had a major push in uh, bringing STEM talent into the force at all levels, uh, whether that's enlisted or on the officer side. So you're going to see more and more energy uh, against this of just not only how we select and promote, but the recruitment of STEM talent in particular. There were more cancellations, cuts, and delays to programs not relevant to the strategy or to modernization of the force made through the Army's night court process you mentioned earlier again this year. Uh, what were the toughest deci decisions that had to be made this year? This year was uh, much more tepid than last year with our moved over $30 billion across the FIDIP last year. It was about uh, north of 12 this time. Uh, the, the ch most of the programs were not as, the, as big or as complex as last year. What, what, you're, what I would kind of focus everyone's attention is in the FY22, 23 timeframe. As we were talking about here on the dais, that the Army is in the midst of a, a very robust test cycle. What's different than where we were 10 years ago or even 20 years ago, we have prototypes that are out there flying, they're exploding, they're driving, you can smell gasoline, this is happening. And that a lot of them are going to be what we're looking for. And then the prioritization of how to scale them across an institution as large as the Army is where the, the real challenges are going to be. So we did find this year, uh, the, I would focus your attention, the FY22 budget is where it really gets tough. And that's where the divestiture of legacy platforms will have to pick up and get into a much higher gear. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who testified in the impeachment inquiry, lost his position as National Security Council aide last week. President Trump told reporters the military could handle him, quote, in any way they want. How will the Army handle Lieutenant Colonel Vindman? Will he be investigated or disciplined? Um, uh, Colonel Vindman was scheduled to come back to the Army. He was detailed to the National Security Council uh, by May, June timeframe. So we brought him back. He's got a basically a bridging assignment for a couple months. 
within uh, uh, an HQDA assignment, and then we'll be heading on to a senior service college this summer. And there's uh, there's no investigations in. In your view, what went wrong with the optionally manned fighting vehicle program, which you spoke of, that caused you to take the recent step back to relook at requirements, strategy, schedule? Was there too much of an emphasis on schedule? Was the relationship between the acquisition community and the modernization community problematic? It was asking for a physical bid sample just too big of an ask. So it's it's taking the authorities that were granted us through Congress over the last three years, though largely the, the leadership of John McCain and Jack Reed uh, with other transactional authorities and a lot of the uh, the way to change the acquisition process. So what these OTAs do is that you can get a, a company on very quickly to get them on contract, but you can look at the weapon system and say, these are the characteristics we're looking for, as opposed to getting super precise up front of a sp with deep specifications. So you're not able to unleash the engineering talent of the vendor that's actually doing business with you. So contractually, it's a little more latitude to work with the contractor to study through prototyping the types of characteristics you want, because they might have a better way of getting to the outcome than we want. So uh, it, we were doing this with the IVAS program, we're doing this on our next generation squad weapon. They're moving very quickly through the process because we've unleashed the power of the engineering talent of these great companies that we're doing business with. So the change in how we approached the contract and the request for proposal and, the, and changes the behavior of how we interact with these companies when developing the weapon system. So we tried doing it the old way and, and we missed uh, pretty big, uh, but we learned a lot. And we spent $23 million instead of spending $2.3 billion like we would have done a decade ago. And the leadership team had the courage to take a step back from the table and say, this is what we want. So we've changed the approach, and we're gonna, uh, we've already stepped out uh, with establishing, using that OTA contracting mechanism. They're gonna come back with uh, sophisticated CAD drawings. We'll take a look at that. We'll do a more detailed set of drawings, and then we'll award two companies to build a prototype. One of the highlighted investment priorities for development is in a low Earth orbit constellation. Why is this so important to the Army, and where does it fit among the Army's top six priorities? Is there a home for this effort? Could it fall under one of your cross-functional teams or the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office to ensure it moves along and is successful? So we have six investment priorities, but we have kind of six plus two, and the reason why it's not eight is because the others cut across all of those six priorities. And back and forth about that for weeks, but ultimately we decided that position navigation and timing would be one of the plus two. The other is synthetic training environment, and they're applicable across all the investment portfolios, so that's why we, we uh, organized them that way. But there, there is an investment portfolio led by a remarkably talented uh, civil, civil servant, uh, Willie Nelson, uh, that has driven this process and why LEO, Low Earth Orbit Satellite uh, Technology, is so extraordinarily important Incredibly resilient, incredibly affordable. Speed to delivery is unprecedented. And when you look at where combat is heading, anybody that has been in a firefight, speed matters. And to be able to detect a threat quickly and to cue a capability to prosecute a target is very important. It, hypersonics, like I mentioned in my speech before, if you're gonna detect a hypersonic glide body that's coming at you, you've got about a couple minutes. So you're gonna do that from a soda straw from geo-Earth orbit or a wider array from a low Earth orbit constellation. So that's why we're uh, obviously very interested in LEO. We've made a lot of investment there. It's a critical uh, component to the modernization strategy. Thank you. What are the differences in deterring Russia and China? You can't have two different armies at once to counter each of them. Great question. The uh, part of the countering or the competition is the presence and the, the, the type of force you need. You obviously have to have a highly lethal one to the, the technological capabilities that we're investing against. Those are best of breed. We want to be the best in the world at all these capabilities because 
America has a perfect record of predicting incorrectly the next war we're going to be in. So we got to make sure we can beat everybody, and uh, whoever that's going to be if they try to challenge us, and we will. But uh, the, you have to make those technological investments so that they're absolute best in the world. But it's a, it's a highly uh, you know, ready force individually that soldiers have to be strong physically, mentally, emotionally. And uh, it's as much of taking care of those soldiers, those technological investments, and you got to have the right posture globally, whether that's on a permanent basis or the ability to dynamically employ the capability, like I mentioned in the formal remarks, the ability to project quickly and to get on the ground shoulder to shoulder with our allies because we never fight alone. Are you concerned that more Army construction projects are targeted for cuts this year to fund the border wall, and what are you doing to restore money to projects that were cut last year? So uh, it, it, there, there is potential of that for another tranche uh, uh, for military construction. We've worked very hard to look at uh, the prioritization with, uh, between readiness and then quality of life related investment programs. Uh, so still a lot of work to do there, but uh, we're getting closer to a solution. The service has revealed where it is drawing $1.13 billion out of lower priority programs to inject into your modernization priorities, but has not accounted for over $1.2 billion in program changes and cuts it intends to make in FY21. Why won't the Army make its entire list of cancellations, delays, and reductions available to the press and subsequently the public? Um, they're already, they're with Congress, so they already are public. We'll, we'll get them today. It's a long one here. Longer than that one? Okay. <laughs> the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle is seen as a bill payer in FY21 for future modernization efforts, and the service will buy less, resulting in a slower procurement schedule without affecting the Army's objective requirement. Your predecessor, Defense Secretary Esper, said while serving as Army Secretary last year that the vehicle was designed and procured in the context of Iraq and Afghanistan and was not as relevant when applied to the fresh national defense strategy guiding Army investment. And he said the Army would most likely cut the total number of vehicles ultimately procured. Right now, the Army is looking at competing for its production in a few years and is signaling it will be procured, likely at a slower rate for the time being. But what is your view about the objective requirement? Is it too high? Will it need to come down? Um, so when you look at our vehicle portfolio, we've got about 48, 49,000 Humvees. The program of record for a JLTV is about 50, 49,000 JLTVs, and then we have an infantry fighting vehicle, about 1,000 of those. That's a breathtaking amount of vehicles for just even for an organization as big as us. So what we've asked for is a study for just how many do we need and what is the appropriate mix. And uh, so that, that's been underway. Uh, we're trying to get towards the end state there because it's again making the best sound investments. You gotta buy only what you need because we're trying to bring in new helicopters, trying to bring in hypersonic missiles, a lot of very sophisticated weapon systems. <coughs> And uh, fiscally, things are getting tough. So we're, we've been putting this type of rigor against every decision. And, uh, and obviously, when you're buying about $850 million worth of JLTVs every year, we're going to take a hard look at that. In December, the Army announced it was canceling and resoliciting a contract to manufacture hundreds of robotic mules through a program known as the Squad Multipurpose Equipment Transport which utilized other transaction authority agreements. Can you please discuss where the Army is right now in the resolicitation of this program? You know, I, I think you got me, finally. Uh, I think we'd, we probably ought to get Bruce Jetty up here. Uh, but uh, I would defer to Dr. Jetty in Army acquisition. I don't know where, the, uh, where we are exactly with the solicitation. The Army is awarding other transaction authority contracts to Kinetic, North America, and Textron to build four light and medium robotic combat vehicle prototypes, respectively. If the prototypes demonstrate the capability that the Army is looking for, 
is the service considering using follow-on OTAs to move the systems into production, or will, its use, will it use the more traditional acquisition process? On a related note, is the Army considering moving its timetable to the left for fielding these vehicles? Obviously, the proof will be in the pudding and how they perform uh, within the, the prototype, the test regime the prototype goes through. OTAs are where General McConville and I have been is we want to use them early and often. It's a mechanism that is really good for American business because it reduces that time to getting something on order, improves their cash flow positions. Uh, it, it's, a, it's the speed of business. So uh, philosophically, we're, we're energized behind it, but we're watching it very closely because it's, it's changing the way we do business in Army acquisition. Uh, so we put a close eye on all of it, but we've uh, definitely put the latitude in place for Dr. Jetty to utilize this as much as possible. Okay, you've been talking about this. Army acquisition in the past has sometimes been criticized for high-profile failures like future combat vehicles and the Comanche Hilo program. How is the Army working to avoid these acquisition failures? So a lot of that was, uh, I, I got to watch a lot of that from OSD was that the requirements leadership were not at the table, the war fighters. What do you want? What are you trying to achieve with this weapon system? We are blessed with an amazing engineering uh, organization, uh, and we have great people in industry, but if the lead, the, you know, it's, it really does come down, that chief of staff of the Army, the vice chief, the force comm commander, they gotta get down and say, what is it gonna take to win in a combat engagement? And they have to drive this process. And they have to say it all the way into the barn and finish. So that's why we went through this restructuring, creating Army Futures Command, to have an organization that brings all the stakeholders together. Because what you saw for a very long time was all the stakeholders are spread out all over the Army. And it would take five to six years to get a requirement done because it's going back and forth between different desks. And it take three or four years to test it and then you buy L-rip tranches and then at about the 20 year mark you field this across the force. So it's like a 19 year old that can throw a 100 mile an hour fastball and you wait till they're 39 to go to the majors, <laughs> right? So I think uh, ultimately you, it's about speed. You gotta get this stuff into the field when it's relevant and then upgrade it over time like a, like a iPhone. Uh, so we, we had to get faster in making decisions. So that's why we brought all the stakeholders together. And when you have the requirements folks laser focus on it, they're working shoulder to shoulder with the acquisition team, that's how we're getting better. Why do I think we're better now? Things are flying and exploding and you can smell gasoline. It's not PowerPoint. 10 years ago, we were buying billions of dollars worth of PowerPoint. And you know you may not reach your ambition, but it's going to be better than what we have today. So uh, I'm encouraged because you see prototypes and you see all of the leaders the, the, all across the continuum, shoulder to shoulder on working the problem. How will Filipino President Duarte's call to end the U.S. basing agreement affect the infantry training you mentioned, and how does it affect our Pacific? presence, how do you plan to reposition as a result? Well, I know the conversations are underway and uh, you know it takes 180 days to get through the diplomatic process to ultimately would be the termination of the, of the VFA. So, so there's about 100, I guess, 74 days, I don't quote me exactly, but it's about that much time uh, that we can work through this diplomatically and I, and I know uh, conversations are underway from the, the White House, the State Department in particular. Uh, the VFA, by changing that, would change the, uh, the, basically the freedoms that you have to do the training, but uh, this is a very close ally, and uh, we would work through that, but it's, it's basically the, the protocols of how you would work together, if it, were, if it actually goes through. The reports on soldier suicides continue to be alarming. What is the Army's approach to reducing these tragedies? Um, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, I think, uh, incredibly difficult problem. And one that, uh, that baffles the brightest scientific minds 
that we have in this country. We've invested an enormous amount of money to try to better understand it. And can you see warning signs as they're in front of you? I, I can tell you there are people that I know personally that had committed suicide and I was stunned. So, you know, it's a, it's understanding what's going on in the human brain. What are we trying to do to do better? It's the simple things and our behaviors, senior leaders talking about it, telling those young men and women that tomorrow won't be the same without you. And it's being a better teammate and it's what we call this is my squad and it's it's as much about reaching your maximum potential and as, as, as it is a taking care of a, of a fellow teammate. So I think that uh, when you get to know each other better, that you're there for them. The thing we do know the most about suicide is people who are very lonely, they're alone. And you know what we try to do is, General McConville and I eat breakfast and lunch together all the time. This is much of showing Civ Mill relations as it is, he's my teammate. I can't get through it one day without him. Talk five, six times a day. And traveling with Sergeant Major, the Army Grinston, and uh, you know, it's being with your teammates as much as possible, sending that message that that's how you get through a hard day. Um, but it's an incredibly hard problem, and as the guy that signs condolence letters, it, it resonates with me every single day. But it's, we're, we're doing our best to get after it. As a follow-up, um, do you have some indications that this approach is working, should the Army take a look at some different approaches to it? Um, I don't have enough data to defend uh, at this point whether or not it's working, but uh, you know the behaviors of a team and the performance of a team become quickly noticeable via how, in the way in which you treat each other. And uh, the thing, if if you know when if my term ends this fall or not but if i walked away this fall the thing i'll probably be the most proud of is the civ mill relationships that we have in our hallway you know i respect and love my teammates and the behaviors are different because of that that you see better teamwork uh, you know results will be what they will uh, but that's how you know you can you, it's the sort of thing that you just say you can feel it uh, but we're trying the best way to how do you quantify this and to see how do you apply metrics to it because people are going to want to see results. Are they going down or not? Thank you. Are any of the soldiers injured in the Iranian counterattack receiving the Purple Heart? So uh, like any uh, combat action, you go through a, a, a review and the justification for award, and they're in the, and they're in the midst of that right now. Other than the Army Corps of Engineers helping build the border wall, how is the Army engaged in Latin America security efforts? So uh, we have Joint Task Force Bravo. We have soldiers deployed uh, in South America, largely in an advise and assist uh, capacity. We have soldiers that are in American embassies all, all across the continent. The Army is implementing a new physical fitness test. Have you had to uh, change it or postpone the full implementation because troops, including National Guard, are having problems implementing and passing it? So, uh, you know, it rolls out over time. The thing we're looking the most closely at is did we get the equipment there in time and did you have the right trainers to help you learn the exercises? Uh, so we're we're looking at very closely on whether or not it would require any change in the timeline that we've laid out. And uh, you know, right now we have Sergeant Major of the Army Tony Grinston leading the process for us, but he, he has a comeback to the chief and I early in the spring to see where we sit. We'll go back to a follow up on a previous question. Since the U.S. went back to um, uh, combat in the Middle East, traumatic brain injuries were considered the most concerning injury. Is that still the case? Well, I think, um, obviously very concerned about uh, TBI cases, but any and all type of injuries, life, health, and safety is, is everything for our people. The national defense strategy focuses on China and Russia. What is the Army's role in a possible conflict in the Pacific? Aren't the Air Force and Navy more important in that region? There were three ground wars in the last century. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of American soldiers 
that fought in all three of those conflicts. Uh, so if you were to look at how these conflicts will begin or end, it's always going to be on the ground. 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Uh, do you have a sense of uh, what uh, will be done to commemorate both VE and VJ days and to honor those who served? I, I don't, but I hope it is big and exciting, and I intend to be at as many of them as I can get to. Get, get to. So, uh, no, it's pretty exciting. And it's the generation that really exposed me to uh, life of service in the Army as a kid that you know, grew up on the north side of Chicago with my grandfather and all his brothers, you know, you know, tail gunners and waste gunners and bombers, and just hearing the stories about World War II is why I wanted to grow up and become a soldier and, and work in the Army. So uh, I, I look forward to that. I will mention that here at the National Press Club, we will help commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II with our American Legion Post 20. Uh, by recreating a series of Saturday afternoon canteens that were conducted here during World War II, w in which um, um, uh, GIs were given hot dogs and beer um, here at the press club. And it was during one of those Saturday afternoon canteens that then Vice President Harry Truman sat at a piano, and Lauren Bacall joined him at the piano to create a very famous photo. Well, you're going to have your hands full of beating that, but. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but I'll come back if you invite me. <laughs> You're on. Do you believe there is a national security emergency on America's southern border as a result of refugees? And if a wall must be built to deal with that influx, should Mexico pay for it, or at least the Department of Homeland Security and not the Defense Department? So I do believe there is a national security uh, issue at the border and that we are in the Department of Defense are, are, are carrying our share of the load. Uh, it's a very difficult problem, but uh, a lot of progress has been made. I'm incredibly proud of the Army Corps of Engineers performance as well as the 4,500 other soldiers that are supporting the Department of Homeland Security. Privatizations of housing have turned into a real challenge on lots of posts. Do you plan to address this issue are you going to change course? Housing is incredibly challenging, uh, kind of like all the other questions you've asked about. But the, uh, um, the housing, we have about um, a th almost a third of our homes that need to be replaced. And uh, this has been incredibly sensitive issue, and it's, it's, uh, it's, but it's, it, it is because it's just so important. Nothing more important than the home for our soldiers and their families. And, you know, this is a, a challenge that's been baking for a long time. But if you look at why, why we went to privatization, is it brought about $13 billion of external financing. And we have been able to build thousands of homes over the last 25 years. And what you saw happen in the process is because we outsourced it, there became an abdication of responsibility from the Department of the Army over time. Up, oh, it's the private housing guy's problem. And the chain of command got out of that business. Now, a lot's happened and you can point fingers both ways. We're not gonna be able to get another 10 or $15 billion to rebuild all these homes. So you've gotta work with these, these corporations, but you've got to manage the relationship. You've got to get out of bed and you've got to tackle problems. You've got to stay on top of things. It may require some legislation to give more authorities to our installation commanders that are going to, are going to drive this responsibility, but it may require more external financing to continue building the homes. Uh, we're going to have a lengthy discussion about that this spring during testimony season, uh, but we're going to bring forward a series of ideas to try to improve our position. Stars and Stripes, the military newspaper read by troops around the world, is facing cuts in the president's proposed budget. Uh, what will that mean for independent reporting on military issues? Uh, yeah, I don't know the, the particulars. Uh, you know, there's been, as we've been talking about throughout lunch today, is just a lot of belt tightening within the department because demands continue to grow on us in a flat fiscal environment. Uh, you know, I read Stars and Stripes clips every day. I, you know, I hope they can weather it. 
Army recruiting has struggled and has turned to e-gaming and other social media to find recruits. How many successful recruits have you gotten through these new programs, and do they bring in quality recruits? Um, are there any new innovations or novel approaches in the pipeline? So this was one that when the, the first time General Frank moved brief this to Army senior leadership, we're like, You're, what are you talking about, Frank? And, uh, but it was, it's what you see coming out of Army Recruiting Command, we're about 18 months into it, is they're getting their finger on the pulse with you know, 17 to 24 year old Americans. What are they into? How do they communicate? And finding those right venues and shaping our messaging to talk about, here's the 150 different things you can do in the Army and the access to education and the, the kinds of people that you can meet and being a part of something you know, as special as this institution. So like, like the, uh, the eSports and this other, when we went to these events, we actually sent General Mark Milley <laughs> when he was chief of staff and now you know, our, obviously our chairman now, um, you know, he said, you're gonna make me do what? And, and then uh, when he went, he learned a lot and he got to engage with uh, young men and women. And what we found is we're getting millions of leads of 17 to 24 year olds to feed into Army Recruiting Command to engage young men and women to see if they'd be interested uh, in a life of service. So uh, we changed our recruiting strategy. We're now focused on 22 cities around the country. So it's having a comprehensive approach against the country so that we can improve our performance in a variety of uh, demographics, whether that's male to female ratios or the ethnicities. Uh, we've improved year over year. Yes, obviously, we hit target last year. We're ahead of pace right now. Uh, this has been, it's been a major turnaround because I think we just got a little lazy and we started losing touch with young men and women and uh, they're, you know, they're growing up in this country and, and it's been a, a big transformation, a lot of, a lot of great leadership with uh, Frank Muth and Tabitha Gavia that run Army Recruiting Command. So um, off to a good start, but you have to sustain this. And we're in a war for talent in this country. Three and a half percent unemployment. It's, uh, they have a lot of opportunities. So you see General McConville and I and others, we travel to a lot of American cities. And we meet with mayors and superintendents of schools and other civic leaders to try to educate those influencers to try to help us in recruiting. And uh, it's, it's yielded tremendous benefit. Secretary McCarthy, I would like to share with our audience today um, the greeting that you put in our guest book, which is signed by all guests to the National Press Club. To the National Press Club, thank you for the honor to address the club today and to share the Army story. A free press and a strong military are necessary to protect the values we hold dear. Thank you for all the work you do and what you do for our country and the world. We thank you for joining us today. We thank you for that greeting. And we would like to present you, if I may just reach over, as a token of our appreciation with our National Press Club coffee mug. <laughs> we hope you will enjoy it in the coming days and weeks and months and years ahead because you may need a few cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs>